Hello, and welcome to How to Avoid Three Common Pitfalls at Each Phase of Your Business. I'm delighted to introduce your presenter, Stephanie Hartman, founder of Catalyst Consulting. With over 20 years of experience and a master's in industrial and organizational psychology, Stephanie's helped leaders and business owners reduce the chaos and bring a calm to their lives and businesses by learning to navigate tricky employee and team performance issues, overcome negative self-talk about how to best use their time, create inspiring integrated goals for their lives and businesses, and make the necessary adjustments to bring those goals to life. Today, Stephanie is going to talk about common pitfalls that create drama for many business owners across the phases of business maturity. Her actionable tips will help you avoid them or escape them if you're already there, giving you confidence about your next steps for less chaos and more calm in your life and business. Thank you, Lisa. According to the U.S. Small Business Administration, only half of all small businesses in America survive past five years, and only one-third survive ten years. Even then, the business survival often comes at a significant cost to the owner. According to Inc. Magazine's The Psychological Price of Entrepreneurship, Countless business founders struggle with anxiety and despair, often compounding the problem by neglecting their health, eating poorly, sleeping too little, and failing to exercise. Many entrepreneurs share innate character traits that make them more vulnerable to depression, hopelessness, worthlessness, loss of motivation, and suicidal thinking. Yikes! Back when I worked in a large corporation, I was part of a team of organization effectiveness consultants. It was there that I had two of my three life-altering experiences that profoundly shaped my practice of helping leaders navigate employee performance challenges while balancing other priorities. The first was being promoted to manager. Studying management and leadership is one thing, but actually being responsible to do it prompted next-level learning. I realized that I was used to getting my job joy from directly, successfully supporting my clients. This new management role required me to achieve success through my employees. That took some adjustment. Plus, I realized how hard it is to apply all those lofty leadership theories and tools when juggling lots of responsibilities and getting emotionally triggered by some of the behaviors of a few of my team members. Increasing my self-awareness and working through some of my challenges allowed me to more compassionately and generously support my clients in their leadership journeys. To set the stage for the second life-altering experience, I should explain that over the course of multiple performance reviews, my managers said I was a stellar performer in my client work and strategy development for our team. However, I really needed to be more respectful of two team members. I smugly responded that those folks were poor performers with lackluster work ethic who were an embarrassment to our team. I believed respect had to be earned. The second life-altering experience was becoming a mother to Taylor, who has Down syndrome. I was overcome with fear that my precious boy would come to experience cruelty and exclusion at work and at school for being different and not contributing brilliant insights. I prayed others would show him compassion, still holding him to high standards, but helping him to be successful and treating him with dignity. What once sounded like wah, 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 Charlie Brown talk from my managers about respect for my team members came into sharp focus. I realized what a jerk I'd been. Dignity is a birthright and need not be earned. While we should have reasonable standards and hold people accountable for achieving them, we owe it to our fellow humans to have those conversations in a way that they may preserve their dignity. This has profoundly impacted the way I deliver feedback to employees and support my clients in doing the same. The third life-altering experience was when I moved from a six-figure corporate job to rural Oregon at the end of the recession with no network and started a business providing leadership coaching and business consulting. I got a serious reality check about competing priorities the business owners face. While I was used to delivering on client promises, I suddenly needed to do that while drumming up business, negotiating contracts, invoicing, monitoring cash flow, managing subcontractors, and more. As happens with many entrepreneurs, launching and growing my business took a serious toll on my confidence, health, and relationships. I gained weight and wasn't resting well. The overwhelm was made worse by self-doubt. 
Being used to success, this plunged me into an existential crisis. I became an impatient mother, an unreliable friend, and a less adoring wife. I was at a breaking point and finally hired a coach to help me work through some of my mindset blocks. This support gave me the renewed energy and confidence to name and address the areas to overhaul to make my business work for my life. This positively impacted my personal life, allowing me to be a more present mother, take better care of myself, and even spend time with friends. I also found I was more thoughtful and creative in supporting my clients, many of whom were struggling with some of the same issues I had faced. Not only have I personally experienced the challenges of running my own business and managing employees, but I've had the privilege of working with small business owners across many industries who courageously shared with me their ambitions and the fears at the root of their missteps. Through these stories, I began to recognize some common pitfalls at each phase of business maturity. For those who did not get help soon enough, those pitfalls either ended their business or the business survived at the cost of the owner's well-being or important relationships. Those who did invest in themselves and their businesses restored balance in their lives and found renewed inspiration. Meaningful change requires the business owner to muster the courage to look honestly at their contribution to the chaos and make tough decisions about processes, people, and more. I have a dream to double the small business success rate in America. By making you aware of these pitfalls, I aim to help you avoid the ones you've not yet encountered or throw you an escape ladder if you're in one now. First, let's look at the three main phases of business. At the top, you'll see the numbered phases progressing from phase one or startup mode. This phase takes an unsustainable amount of energy from the owner. So survival requires moving to phase two before running out of resources. If you simply want a business that produces good work and allows you to pay yourself and your team a fair wage, you may choose to stay in phase two. Awesome. Plenty of businesses happily hang in phase two for decades and even pass it on to family or sell it at this level of business maturity. It's important to know your end goal. For entrepreneurs who have their sights on massive amounts of money or impact, it is generally necessary to grow exponentially into an enterprise, which is phase three. The rows stretching left to right across the three phases represent categories. The top row is the most logic-driven category with the most emotion-driven category at the bottom. Systems for sanity are the practices and processes used to get things done. Making money is how you package and price your services and secure new customers. Founder's focus is the area or areas of the business where you personally dedicate time and energy. At the bottom are the pitfalls. Pitfalls are the classic problematic thoughts and behaviors that stifle business success. The phase one pitfall is ignorance is bliss and drama is glorified. In phase one or startup mode, systems tend to be fairly non-existent. If you have any, you probably sketch them on the back of a cocktail napkin at a happy hour and only sometimes use them. As far as making money goes, you typically have a rough menu of products or services with shot in the dark prices, and the sales and marketing efforts tend to be pretty random. Here, the founder's focus generally isn't. You are operating as Jack or Jill of all trades, juggling, trying to figure out what you're doing, finding customers, and doing the actual work for your limited customers. The struggles at this phase produce learning, so you can make improvements, but beware of the phase one pitfall. Ignorance is bliss and drama is glorified happens when you lack sufficient business skill and don't invest time and money on developing a solid plan for how to best use your time and accomplish your goals. If you're here, you are blindly working harder, doing more of the stuff you have been doing, wearing yourself out, and brag complaining about how busy you are running a business. The escape from ignorance is awareness. Look with a critical eye on each category of your business, evaluating what is and isn't working. For systems, make lists or drawings, or whatever works for you, to map out the flow for each of your processes. How do you set, work toward, and stay on top of your goals? What are the steps you take to complete your work for your customers? How do you handle contracts, invoices, and money management? What about the revenue generating client work? How much time on marketing? What about product development? What about errands and administrative tasks? How about on family and self-care? The very act of writing these things out will illuminate areas for improvement. If you survive the first phase, you likely got support to navigate your blind spots, 
and hired help to lighten the load. The pitfall of phase two is tolerance of the irrelevant war hero. Business growth requires new systems to handle the volume and ensure consistent quality. In phase two, you've developed some routines and are doing better record keeping. You're probably using standard, low-cost, generic office software like Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, project management software like Trello, and maybe a bare-bones, industry-specific application you can afford. As far as making money goes, you've evolved the products or services you offer. You've probably settled on a somewhat reasonable combination of how many of what products or services you need to sell and at what price in order to pay the bills. You are also more focused and intentional about your sales and marketing efforts. For founders focus, you've hired support in the form of contractors or employees. Those folks may join you in doing the money-making work of your business or the non-preferred behind-the-scenes support like bookkeeping or marketing that frees you up to make more money. That brings us to the pitfall. Tolerance of the irrelevant war hero occurs when the scrappy person who was in the trenches with you at the beginning with their duct tape and Swiss army knife, making sure stuff got handled back in the day, is now unwilling or unable to embrace new systems or higher standards, but you can't bring yourself to really hold him or her accountable. I cannot overstate this. Even if you have no intention to scale to phase three, your business can die a slow and painful death in phase two due to avoiding conflict in the disguise of loyalty. In one organization, the founder's right hand had been with her for 10 years, joining soon after the business began. She had helped the founder weather some super rough patches in the business and kept things in relative working order if the founder needed to leave. As the business grew, Procedures were put in place to ensure the lessons that had been learned over time were applied and that all the staff doing a particular task did it the same way. Unfortunately, since the 10-year veteran considered herself the expert, she rarely followed the updated procedures, even though she had influenced the design of most of them. She knew how to follow them, was capable of following them, but was simply unwilling to change her habits. The founder brought it to her attention countless times. Every time the irrelevant war hero promised to try harder, but never changed, this literally went on for years. On top of steps being skipped by the irrelevant war hero, team members who followed the new processes noticed when the old timer got away with noncompliance. The double standard of expectations being enforced for some, but not others, created team dynamics, drama, and inconsistent client experiences. That resulted in demands for refunds, as well as diminished teamwork and turnover. What can you do to escape this pitfall? The escape from pitfall two is clear feedback. Avoiding a tough conversation, camouflaged as loyalty, is not respectful or helpful. As Brene Brown says in Dare to Lead, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. Anytime you're struggling with an employee's performance, I recommend reflecting on the following. What are the expectations you have of a person in this role? How have those expectations been communicated? Does he or she have the necessary tools and information to do a good job? Has he or she been trained on how to do the job in the way it needs to be done? What motivates this employee and are his or her needs being met? This reflection may lead you to discover your contribution to the situation and recognition additional support may be needed. It may also reduce some of the hostility you're probably feeling towards the employee, which will definitely help the feedback conversation go much better. If after multiple conversations and reasonable support has been provided, there's no significant improvement, give a last-ditch effort. Be clear about the consequences if the performance does not improve and the date by which improvement is needed to maintain employment. Checking in again about what support might help. Some business owners manage to avoid or quickly escape the pitfall when the irrelevant war hero has become apparent. They survive the pitfall by having candid, respectful conversations that either provided the clarity and support needed for the war hero to improve and restore relevance, or gave the business owner confidence all reasonable efforts had been made to support the war hero's success to no avail, thereby leaving a clear conscience to part ways with the irrelevant war hero with grace and gratitude, freeing her to find another place where her scrappy disposition would be welcomed. Assuming the business continuously refines its routines, offers, and distribution of work, and has successfully avoided or escaped the earlier pitfalls, 
a business can survive just fine for many years in phase two. However, if the founder has an interest in exponential growth, making a bigger impact and bigger revenue, it generally needs to scale to phase three. The phase three pitfall is fear of heights. This is where you've maxed what your Excel spreadsheets can do for you, and your systems for sanity include specialized applications for different aspects of your business, like customer management, finance, inventory, and higher-end industry-specific software with more horsepower. Plus, in Phase 3, they are more integrated, so information can be used across them. For making money, you've done a major overhaul to the revenue model that was used in Phase 2, with entirely new product lines, or customer groups, or pricing. Plus, the business development activity is much more data-driven and regularly calibrated. By this phase, the work of managing the business and the work of operations are each full-time jobs. So by this phase, if not before, for founders' focus, replacements have been hired for one or both roles. This allows the founder to do just one of these roles or step out of both and move on to something else. Here in phase three, the pitfall is called fear of heights. This occurs when the business owner wants the business to expand exponentially, but is afraid of the required risk. This fear manifests in an unwillingness to give up control and sharing top leadership responsibility, invest in the necessary resources for specialized tools, or is intimidated to learn to use them. Your escape options for the fear of heights pitfall are to either accept a ceiling of success or face your fears. Begin thinking early about the size you're committed to growing your business. Consider what's at stake if you don't and what's possible if you do. Even in the early stages, as different opportunities present themselves for investing in specialized tools, hiring pricey experts, or gaining huge visibility, notice how you make decisions. Is it logical or emotional? Increasing your awareness to the triggers to your fear will help keep you in your power and improve your ability to work through big decisions. As a recap, the escape from pitfall one, ignorance is bliss and drama is glorified, is awareness. Look with a critical eye on each category of your business. The escape from pitfall two, tolerance of the irrelevant war hero, is clear, respectful feedback. The escape from pitfall three, fear of heights, is accepting a ceiling of revenue and impact, or face your fears. If you find yourself heading towards, are in, or are still reeling from one of these pitfalls and would like my help, I can be your cheerleader, sounding board, advisor, confidant, and accountability partner through my leader and organization development program. Some of my clients' outcomes from the program include owners finally taking vacations, avoiding bankruptcy, industry and community awards, reduction in staff turnover, even in high turnover industries, selling the business and retiring. The program begins with a free confidential fit check where I will go over the program approach with you and we both make sure we feel comfortable to work together. Then, for the assessment, I'll interview the folks you and I determine are best positioned to confidentially share the strengths and areas for development for you and your organization. Based on this and my interview with you, I'll customize a 12-session program to address your needs and share that plan with you. Following the 12 sessions, I will reassess to determine your progress. Once struggling with significant team dynamics challenges and growing pains, veterinarian Ann Michael said, when reflecting on the Leader in Organization Development Program, thank you so much for all of your support in helping me grow as a business owner and a leader. Your coaching and classes have provided me with the tools and skills necessary to recognize problems, to deal with various situations, and to create a successful business and team. Greg Boudreau, board member for Electronics Assemblers, said, you have been a tremendous asset to EAI and Bill's development as a CEO. The board members of EAI have certainly noticed it in the company's results, employees, and customers. We appreciate your involvement. It appears we have another exciting year ahead of us. The median cost for executive coaching and custom organization development support by a qualified expert is $600 per session, making it inaccessible to many small business owners. Since I want to double the small business success rate in America, and frankly, I have a lot more fun working with them, I have packaged and priced my program for small businesses at $7.45 for three sessions. Plus, the program includes unlimited Can I Run Something By You phone, texts, and email support. 
I give you access to any of my templates, tools, and samples. And as a bonus, all participants in my Leader and Organization Development Program get a free seat in any of my publicly offered half-day classes to use for themselves or give to an employee. Email me to request your free confidential fit check to begin the Leader and Organization Development Program so you can avoid, escape, or recover from the pitfalls of business ownership. I look forward to supporting you and replacing the chaos with calm.